ready to re begin. Obviously, the point I'm making is there's something wrong with humankind, but let me keep going with this. Uh, Stanley Milgram was just amazed at World War II, frankly. I just just blown away that people just what seemed to be average citizens could torture and murder right just uh, just average folks could be part of something this uh, just horrific and so what he did is he decided to set up what looked like a traditional learning experiment and he ran an ad this is through Yale he ran an ad in the newspaper and he in, said, come on down for a traditional learning experiment and we'll pay you, give you a little bit of money for it. And people would arrive at the door uh, in pairs at about the same time. He'd say, come at 9.15. And so a couple of people would arrive at the laboratory door at 9.15 and they'd come in and he'd flip a coin and one of them would be called, one of them would be designated the teacher and the other one would be designated the learner. Now the learner was strapped down and put behind glass, and the teacher was uh, given a, sh a board of things where he could shock the learner, and whenever the learner didn't get the word pairs correctly, the teacher was instructed to give him a shock, and the shocks increased. By the way, before this began, uh, the, the teacher was given a very real 45 volt shock. I mean, he was shocked with a very real 45 volts. So, and that was just 45 volts. Well, anyway, and the experimenter would say, well, okay, you got it wrong, so shock him again, give him the next level. This is the actual thing that was used, the shock generator. Uh, and it's obviously, it's kind of hard to see, but it goes all the way. You might see here, danger goes from, on the left, it goes from slight shock and then on the right, it goes all the way to so not just severe shock. It says here, danger, severe shock. And then it goes over and it just has three X's at 450 volts. In other words, you're going to give a severe shock in the 300s. But by the time you get to 400, 450 and so on, we don't even know what's going to happen. It's just X, X, X. This is bad, right? Well, uh, at around 300 volts, of shock, the, the learner would start screaming and begging to be released and, start co and, and it soon started complaining that his heart hurt, demanded that the experiment continue. The experimenter told the teacher to just give him another thing, give him another couple of word pairs when he got it wrong, said, okay, shock him again. And I think, well, somewhere approaching 400 volts, the, the learner just went, stopped responding whatsoever. And the teacher, uh, the experimenter told the teacher, just keep shocking him. As, because consider no answer to be a wrong answer and keep shocking him. What happened with this experiment? 65% of everybody that came in to do it administered 450 volts just because they were asked to do it. Even though the person they were shocking was screaming and begging to be released. And it's important to point out that there was absolutely no difference, no difference at all between men and women. Women, 65% of all women administered the same shock, 65% of all men administered 450 volts. Both of them did. Well, this was just, well, to use a pun, shocking to the psychological world. I mean, they were, the psychological world was appalled and shocked, amazed, stunned. All kinds of articles were written over this. By the way, no one, and I mean, I'm not aware of anyone disputing the results of this test because not only was, did Milgram, was Stanley Milgram very, very careful in administrating it, the entire thing was videotaped, all of it. Uh, and, and you can see some of this if you, you know, go to, you know, online, you can see some of this, of these actual experiments. Well, uh, so they started in different groups or different psychologists wanted to reproduce the experiment. One of them was David Mantell and he went to Germany in 1970. He only did, he only studied men though between 19 and 49 years old, 19 and 49 year old men in Germany. Now this is only 25 years after the end of World War II, but he's just curious. 
what's going to happen? What he found in his study is 85% of all the men that he had in uh, gave 450 volts of electricity. Listen to his very sad conclusion. He says, <clears throat> this experiment becomes more incredulous and senseless the further it is carried. It disqualifies and delegitimizes itself. It can only show how much pain one person will impose on another, and yet the subjects carry on. That is at once the beauty and tragedy of this experiment. It proves that the most banal and superficial rationale is perhaps not even necessary, but surely is enough to produce destructive behavior in human beings. We thought that we'd learned this from our history books. Perhaps now we've learned it in the laboratory. In other words, we can pre reproduce in the laboratory what happened in Cambodia or Auschwitz or, you know, the Ukraine or wherever, Nanking. People will torture each other very easily. Stanley Mogum concluded that you could have staffed Auschwitz with the average population of New Haven, Connecticut. So Alexander Solzhenitsyn asks this question, that's Alexander Solzhenitsyn there, in his Gulag Archipelago, which has one thing going for it, I, I can't resist this, if you're at a party and you need to sound erudite, just say, oh yeah, I was reading Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, and it'll, of course, I think people will think you're a snob more than anything else. But anyway, he's, Alec, Solzhenitsyn spent eight years in a Soviet gulag, and this is what Solzhenitsyn concluded. He says, where did this wolf tribe appear from among our people? Does it really stem from our own roots, our own blood? He says, it is our own. And just so that we don't go around flaunting too proudly the white mantle of the just, let eat everyone ask himself, if my life had turned out differently, might I myself not have become such an executioner? He says, it's a dreadful question if one answers it honestly. And so let me ask you to think about this. If your life had turned out differently, if you had not become a Christian, if you were not raised in the family that you were raised in, but you were raised in another family, in another situation when, you're, when you weren't and you didn't become a sincere believer in Jesus, could you have been a guard in Auschwitz? There's two possible answers to that, right? There's two possible answers. Yes or no. If somebody says no, that somehow, even if my life circumstances were different, I'm innately incapable of committing Auschwitz, I'd have two comments to make. First, on what basis would you conclude that you're innately incapable of doing Auschwitz? I mean, what would the basis for that be? On how, how so many millions of people, and I do mean millions of people, have participated in genocide. How were you innately incapable of committing genocide yourself? But the second thing that I would do is I would point out to somebody who thought they were innately better than all the people that have committed genocide, that to believe that you're innately better than all the people that you've, that, than other people is always the father of genocide, right? The father of genocide is I'm innately better than all these other people, right? Uh, I share these, I, I, we're gonna go through some more observations because these are very, very, very interesting to me and here's the interesting conclusion. Well, well, I'll say it now. I've read a lot, I've done a lot of genocide studies, a lot of genocide mass murder studies, a lot. I've read lots of stuff on this and yes, frankly, I had a couple of dark years in reading this stuff but I just felt like I needed to do it and there was something just amazing about it, and that is, I, and I've I mentioned this to audiences a bunch of times, I don't know of even one researcher or victim of genocide, not even one researcher or victim of genocide who has written about it that doesn't just conclude that this is what average people do. Not one. They all conclude that this is what average people do. That's why I assigned you Christopher Browning's book, Ordinary Men, Police Battalion 101, and the Final Solution in Poland. 
Because that's Browning's conclusion. And so here we have Solzhenitsyn, he says, let's everybody ask themselves, if my life had turned out differently, might I too become such an executioner? And he says, it's a terrible question if one answers it honestly, because Solzhenitsyn's answer was, I could have done it too. That's the lesson, I could have done it. George Crenn, historian George Crenn and psychologist Re Leon Rappaport did a lot of uh, study in, in uh, the Holocaust. Listen to their conclusion. What remains is a central, deadening sense of despair over the human species. Where can one find an affirmative meaning in life if human beings can do such things? Along with this despair, there may also come a desperate new feeling of vulnerability attached to the fact that one is human. If one keeps at the Holocaust long enough, then sooner or later the ultimate truth begins to reveal itself. One knows, finally, that one might either do it or be done to. If it could happen on such a massive scale elsewhere, then it can happen anywhere. It's all within the range of human possibility, and like it or not, Auschwitz expands a universe of consciousness no less than landings on the moon. He's right. And I, it's very interesting to me. How does a non-Christian respond to this? You see, let me go back to the phrase here where he says, and the word along, he says, um, or let me back up. Oh, there it is. If one, keeps at the, if one keeps at the Holocaust long enough, then sooner or later the ultimate truth begins to reveal itself. One, one knows finally that one might either do it or be done to. That was the revelation to me. Now, let me explain how I got started studying genocide and torture and mass murder and stuff. I started studying it many years ago because, partially because I didn't want the skeptic or the atheist to disqualify me and say, Clay, wow, you really haven't looked hard at man's inhumanity to man. You know, I call it man's humanity to man. But you really didn't look at it. You've glossed over Auschwitz, Buchenwald. Uh, you've glossed over the killing fields. You've glo you, know, you really haven't come to grips with it. And I thought, well, I don't want people to be able to say, if I'm going to write and talk on why God allows evil, I don't want them to go, oh, well, you know, I mean, you didn't, you know, the way you're getting out of the problem is just by going, hey, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, there's that stuff, kind of push it under the carpet and move on. So I, I think one of the first books I read was Iris Chang's, one of the first, there was others, uh, one of the first though was Iris Chang's The Rape of Nan King. And as I was sitting there reading Iris Chang's book, all of a sudden, this revelation hit me that was just frankly life-changing. And the revelation was, this is what humans do. Humans do this. And this is what Crenn and Rappaport right here are saying. They say, if you keep at it long enough, the ultimate truth begins to reveal itself. One realizes sooner or later that you could do it. This is the ultimate truth. There is something wrong, my brothers and sisters in Christ, with the race of Adam, isn't there? If it doesn't take that much for us to do Auschwitz. There's something desperately wrong, and original sin, by the way, best explains what on earth could cause ordinary people, given the provocation, the willingness to start to kill each other. So Israel Charney, another researcher, says, sometimes sitting in a staff hospital, he's a psychiatrist, at a modern psychiatric hospital, I could see how genocide could happen. The ingredients were all there, the bitter, hating factions among the staff disguising themselves in the pomp and circumstance of a mental health conference the barely disguised superiority and disdain for the hapless patient, the patronizing professional sympathy and righteousness that barely concealed the brutality of so-called modern therapies of electric shock and brain surgery, the dehumanizing everyday herding of anonymous patients into anonymous routines everywhere in lovely families that persecuted one or more of their members, in the universities I loved where faculty intrigues and hatred knew no bounds, in the ruthless coup de grace of business killings, in the pompous coldness of exalted physicians turning away from the death fears of their patients. He says, I can see genocide happening everywhere I look. I think it's, you know, he mentions the, uh, the hatred where 
faculty intrigues and hatreds in universities knows no bounds. Somebody, I don't remember who said this, and he said, uh, somebody has put it, the reason that faculty, the faculty intrigues and animosity and faculty warfare is so severe is because the stakes are so small. <laughs> anyway, um, I guess you'd have to be on the faculty to realize it. Anyway, um, yes, Ron. <clears throat> Right. In fact, I don't know whether I still have a slide on it, but some uh, philosophers call it moral luck. That, that, a German, that a German who happened to move to uh, Argentina before the beginning of World War II might have lived a normal, happy family life, but the German who stayed behind uh, in Germany might have been a guard at Auschwitz, and, and some philosophers just call it moral luck. Now, I don't ascribe it to moral luck. I'm just saying, but... but what happens is, is, and I'm going to talk about, we're, we're not done here, believe me, I've still, I'm, I'm going, I think, to where you're talking about why, what's going on here. Uh, so uh, I guess what I'm saying is hang in there for a minute because I'm, I'm going in that direction. So uh, hang, stay with me, stay with me. If I don't answer it, though, by all, before the night's up, you make sure we go, we talk about it some more, but I think we're going there. So hang on just a second. Harold Wells, or a sociologist, put it this way, we are left with the most discomforting of all realities, ordinary normal people committing acts of extraordinary evil. This reality is difficult to admit, to understand, to absorb. As we look at the perpetrators of genocide and mass killing, we need no longer ask who these people are. We know who they are. They're you and I. Thomas Nagel, in fact, this is his book, I, I do have a slide on it. Here it is. More, Thomas Nagel, who wrote Moral Luck, someone who was an officer in a concentration camp might have led a quiet and harmless life if the Nazis had never come to power in Germany. And someone who had led a quiet, harmless life in Argentina might have become an officer in a concentration camp if he'd not left Germany for business reasons in 1930. But I think, uh, Ron, just another comment about this. This is representative of the fact that if your circumstances go in a certain way and you're you know, people kill easily. I think that's really the bottom line, is people kill easily. And I'm, but I'm going to keep on with that. People kill easily. This is the book that really started it all, was Hannah Arndt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. Hannah Arndt decided to go, that's Eichmann there. Eichmann was the administrator of Auschwitz. Uh, not the commandant, but the administrator. He kept it running. And so she thought, I'm going to go and watch. You know, they caught Eichmann. Uh, and they, they tried him in Israel, and so she thought, I'm going to go watch what happens. Listen to her conclusion. The main trouble with Eichmann was that there were so many like him, neither perverted nor sadistic, that they were and still are terribly and terrifyingly normal. Do you see the trend here? The trend among these researchers and even victims is, this is what normal people do if they think they can get away with it and have the motive. This is what they do. Thus, Christopher Browning, the book I assigned, I could have been the killer or the evader, says Christopher Browning. Both were humans, because what's his conclusion? This is what humans do. Humans do this, right? This is his conclusion. How about, this is a very interesting book. I used to assign this book uh, before I, I switched to police or uh, ordinary men. Uh, Langdon Gilkey uh, wrote a book entitled The Shantung Compound, The Story of Men and Women Under Pressure. 
fascinating book. In fact, uh, Christianity Today did a survey of, their, of Christian leaders in the year 2000, and they asked Christian leaders to nominate the best 100 books of the 20th century, and this was, not, this was one of uh, the best 100 books of the 20th century, the Shantung Compound. But so Langdon Gilkey is a liberal theologically, and he's in China when the war breaks out, and the Japanese intern him with other people, many of the missionaries and whatnot, in uh, this compound called the Shantung Compound. And so for the rest of the war, right, he's now basically in an internment camp. And, he's, and his, if you read the Shantung Compound, his initial response was, all right, this is where humankind pulls together, you know? When things get tough, humans just, they, man, they are there for each other. It's just going to be a great time. He was looking forward to it because, and he believed in the goodness of man. This is, his, this is how his thinking began to go. This fundamental bent of the total self in all of us was inward towards our own welfare. And so immersed were we in it that we hardly seemed able to see this in ourselves, much less extricate ourselves from this dilemma. Good people and bad people found it incredibly difficult, not to say impossible, to will the good, that is to be objective in a situation of tension and to be generous and fair to their neighbors. He concludes, nothing indicates so clearly the fixed belief in innate human goodness than does this confidence that when the chips are down and we are revealed for what we really are, we will all be good to each other. Nothing could be so totally in error. So there it is again. You know, oh, hey, it's going to be great. We're going to pull together. Woo. Believe me, he did not leave the Shantun compound believing in the goodness of humankind. Elie Wiesel, the famous Auschwitz survivor, the most famous Auschwitz survivor, has done lots and lots of writing about Auschwitz and the Holocaust. In his book, The Town Beyond the Wall, he wrote, Deep down, man is not only an executioner, not only a victim, not only a spectator, he's all three at once. So we come to this verse. Now, so what have I been doing? Right? I've been giving you verses to try to get you to really believe what you say you believe as a result of your initial confidence in Jesus. Because you come to Jesus and you go, oh, I believe this and this is true. But I've been trying to get you to begin to, to really believe what you say you believe because you're a Christian. <clears throat> so now we come to a scripture that says just what I've been saying. Romans 3.10 There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their mouths are full of cursing, their feet are swift to shed blood. I think for many of you, and I'm not going to ask for a personal testimony time here, it would take too long, and anyway. I think for some of you, you've read this verse, in Romans and gone, yeah, yeah, it's true, whatever that means, you know, I'm not sure my, you know, this person or that could really do it. And I'm, I, I, I imagine a lot of you, frankly, just didn't really deeply believe it. I'm sure you would have assented to it because, right, we're Christians and we believe this is the word of God. But I think many of you wouldn't just simply have really deeply believed it. And so let's talk about human niceness now. Uh, and uh, so something that Jordan brought up what about just kind of good people, so-called good people? Jesus addresses this in Luke chapter 6, verse 32, where he says, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? And if you let, even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who, from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full, right? I mean, so you're nice to people that are nice to you. Everybody does that. That's nothing new. Um, I have this picture. It's probably not in perfect position, but 
one of the, when, whenever you talk about human goodness, the first thing thrown at you is Mahatma Gandhi. And they say, well, he wasn't a Christian, but he was a good person. No, no, he wasn't a good person, not even close. Uh, those are his nieces. And he, li- he got into bed naked with them being naked too. And a whole bunch of other women all the time. It was a sign, by the way, of his uh, reaching certain spiritual states if he could be unaroused getting into bed all the time with naked women. And frankly, I'm not going to get into any more lurid details, but if you, well, Google it, and you'll find a whole bunch on it. And not just with his nieces, but with a whole bunch of weird things, frankly. Uh, He wasn't a good person. Understand now, doing a good act doesn't make you a good person. It makes you the doer of a good act, you understand. Doesn't make you, it doesn't make you a good person. So lending things to people doesn't make you a good person. That doesn't, I mean, sinners do that. They lend if they're going to get it back, right? Now, this hopefully, and this is, Ron, I think this is going to help what we were talking about a little more. This is what Jesus, the Lord of life, had to say. And I think we need to look at this a little bit more deeply. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 28, but I tell you, that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now think about this. And think about two people who are working in a company and both of a man and woman and both of them are married to other people, right? And you know, let's you know, they start flirting this guy and this gal office romance thing. They start flirting with each other and Maybe even after a while, they start having sexual fantasies about each other. Maybe, in fact, they begin to realize that, you know, I think this person, the other person really does like me. In fact, I think this person really might even be interested in having more than just liking me. Uh, And like I say, they're fantasizing sexually about each other. Well, if they're fantasizing about each other sexually, and they have good reason to believe that the other person might actually do the deed with them, why don't they do it? It's not because they decided to cherish and honor their spouse, right? Because, I mean, we've already established that they're fantasizing about having sex with somebody else, you know, I mean, so it isn't because of wanting to cherish their spouse, right? So why aren't they doing it? They don't want to get caught. Right, they don't want to get caught. And they don't want maybe a disease. Whoa, I don't want to bring something home that my wife didn't, you know. I mean, whoa, hey, where'd you get that? That'd be bad. That's a tough conversation. Um, Or uh, pregnant. Uh Uh-oh. Or I don't want her husband to find out and maybe kill me. Or my spouse would divorce me and even though I'm not being faithful to her in my head, I've got this family and stuff, I don't want to lose everything I've got in my reputation. But notice something about this. You're not having sex, well, I didn't say you're, but this guy and gal aren't having sex with each other, not because they're moral. They're not doing the deed out of self-interest. That doesn't make you a good person. That's why Jesus says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In other words, you're an adulterer. If you're not doing it, it's because of self-interest and not committing adultery because of self-interest simply doesn't make you, you're still an adulterer. You're just protecting your hiney, right? So John says in 1 John 3.15, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So again I ask you, if somebody hates somebody, why don't they murder them? Well, we've already established it isn't because they care for the person or you know, because they, we've already established that they hate the person. So it isn't because they have any feelings or care for the person. They hate their guts. Well, why don't they murder? Why don't they murder? Consequences. Consequences. Self-interest. That's why. 
I was spe- I spoke at a church, and on my business, or last week I spoke at a church. In fact, uh, one of my brothers is here, you know, one of the fellow joined me tonight uh, from the church, but um, wanted to sit in this session. But I always bring up, what, why do gangbangers stop at red lights? <laughs> is it because they go, well, you know what, when it comes to red lights, that's where I want to obey the law? Right, hey, you know what, when it comes to red lights, you know, I'm a law-abiding person when it comes, well, why do gangbangers stop at red lights? Is it, you know, sometimes people go, well, because they don't want a ticket. Well, yeah, maybe that's a reason, but I, you know, most of the time we know there's not a cop around. So I ask you again, why do gangbangers stop at red lights? Because they don't want to be T-boned by an 18-wheeler doing 50 miles an hour. Right? And it isn't because they've decided that they're going to be law-abiding and that, hey, you know, I have a real respect for civil law. Right? It's, I don't want to get killed. Do you see something here? Not if in your heart you are an adulterer and in your heart you are a hater, thus you are a murderer in your heart. Now what we've seen, Ron, is that when people think they can get away with it and they begin to have half a reason to do it, they will do it. If they think they can get away with it, there's no consequence, right? In all of these, like Rwanda, where they went around with machete, they thought, hey, we're going to get, they didn't get away with it, but they thought, you know, we are fine. Uh, In fact, Solzhenitsyn actually says, you know, he says, uh, contrary to what the atheist might want to believe, he says, uh, he says, the belief in God will keep people from doing bad things. He says, but when you only have the state to answer to, but the state is saying, hey, we're for killing these people, You have nothing to lose then, do you? Nothing to lose. Kill. Thus, there is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their mouths are full of cursing. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Yes? So we can see the fact that we are all depraved enough to find ourselves in that situation, like Solzhenitsyn said, if I can stop and think about it, it's dependent on our circumstances. Believers, I'm not talking about, now this is where people are, some people are going to get upset with me. Non-Christians aren't going to like this. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. The believer is born again. The believer is now a hybrid. If you're a Christian, you're a hybrid. You're part earth, part heaven. You're a hybrid. You're born from above. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so as a Christian, no, you... In fact, I'm going to go the other way. A Christian will not murder. A Christian will not murder because they've been born from above. I'm talking about the unregenerate, which we all were at one time. That person can murder. By the way, you know, I, I, I don't know about you... Maybe if you were homeschooled, you avoided this, but I went to a public junior high, and I didn't get out of junior high without being an adulterous murderer. I hated kids, they hated me. It was mutual. And frankly, well, I don't need to explain the adulterous part as a junior high boy. Um, I was an adulterous murderer by the time of junior high, and probably most of you were too. I think, I, I kid a little bit about the homeschool kid uh, thing, because some homeschool kids, I mean, they're, it, it's just, you know, I mean, well, they may not be around any kids that hate their guts. But anyway, my junior high, we had plenty of kids that hated my guts, and I hated them. Anyway, so that was, a, but that's a human condition, right? So John 3.19 says, this is the verdict, the light has come into the world, but men love the darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. So Jesus says, why does, the, why does he eat with tax, or they said, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus heard this. He said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came to call the right, not the righteous, but the sinners. 
Now, what did Jesus mean there? Did Jesus mean that he isn't interested in calling righteous, healthy people? Is that what Jesus meant? No, right? Jesus means there are no righteous, healthy people. Some people, however, think they are righteous, healthy people, and Jesus didn't come to call them. He came to call those who recognize that they're sick sinners. Only those really who have an abiding sense of being a sick sinner is ready to come to Jesus. Those who think they're good persons, I'm a good person, which by the way is the majority of Americans and for that matter the majority of people in the world, they're good persons. Well, how are they good persons? Because they, even though they're watching porn and lusting their brains away and hating their boss or whoever, because they're not actually committing adultery, that doing the deed, or actually pulling the gun and shooting somebody, they're not like those people who murder and rape or murder and you know have affairs on their wife and kids. So the, see, I'm a good person. That's so Jesus' job, Jesus is what Jesus was doing all the time, was trying to get people who thought they were good persons to realize they weren't good persons so that they would be, know that they needed to be saved and come to him. That's why his harshest words were for the Pharisees who what? Believed they were good people. By the way, law and gospel is, the reformers really nailed down how law and gospel works. Some people, I hear Christians will say, oh, well, I only preach, you know, other people preach judgment and they preach wrath. Well, I only preach the law of God. Like, hey, I'm really a step above and more enlightened than my other uh, Christians. Uh, look, uh, let's get something straight about this here. Here's how the reformers put it, and it's spot on. Uh, law is only preached to secure, law and judgment is only preached to secure sinners. And grace is only preached to insecure sinners. You don't preach grace and the love of God to a secure sinner. Why? Because you make them an even more secure sinner. You don't go up to somebody who goes, yeah, I'm a good person and I think I'm doing good and I'm already, you know, of course God would want me in heaven. We don't go, hey, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life and he's, he's all about grace. Because they already think they're going to heaven, they already think they're good, right? So what you do is, you, to the person who thinks they're good, you preach judgment and the wrath of God in the hopes of making them insecure sinners, in which time you can give them grace. That, you see this in Jesus' life. Look at what Jesus is doing. To the, to the prostitute and the tax collector who were in no danger, by the way, of ever thinking they were good people, ever, Jesus is like, come to me. To the Pharisee, he's only preaching judgment because he wants the Pharisee to realize that they're really sick sinners and thereby be able to be saved. By the way, just a point to consider, another point to consider, if you decide to willfully disobey God on any point, Think about this. Regardless of how minor, and I'm, not, I'm talking about, you know what, God says I shouldn't do this, but I'm just, from now on, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to disobey God. Once you decide that, no matter how minor, you are making the de facto decision that you will not be obeying God at all. Instead, when you do His will, you're only doing it because you happen to agree with what, uh, you happen to agree with what you think is best. Uh, you know, hey, I, I do, oh yeah, I only disobey God on one thing. I obey Him on the other things. Well, you're not obeying Him, really. You've just happened to agree that the other thing, He's right about the other things. Because once you decide, no, God's wrong, well, on anything, you're just a rebel. So why are people being good to each other? As Lewis put it, everyone feels benevolent as not, if nothing happens to be annoying Him at the moment. It's true, you know, people just generally, hey, yeah, you know, I got a buck for you. You need a little help out there. You know, I mean, if the, but if you're in trouble, frankly, I don't watch it anymore. I watched the first couple of seasons of it, and uh, I, I like, I spent 15 years working in the business world, and, and so when Donald Trump came out with his, uh, uh, 
with his apprentice show and they were actually trying to hire people. I, I, I thought it was kind of fun because I've worked in the business world. We'll see how these challenges go. And, and it's interesting though, if you watch this kind of show, they can be so smiles and everything with each other, but boy, when it comes to the boardroom, they're throwing each other under the bus. Because <laughs> if it's between you and me, you're going down, buddy. Uh, it's just, it, that, that's just the way human nature is. Now I'm going to bring you, by the way, to Jesus' clearest teaching on the problem of evil. Here it is. Here's Jesus' absolutely most unmistakable and clearest teaching on the problem of evil. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. And the, and, and the scripture says, Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So get the picture here. Pilate just kind of kills some people willy-nilly, helter-skelter, and kind of and mixes it in with the sacrifices. In other words, it's kind of a terrorist act, really. Why is he killing these people? And so they come to Jesus and they go, so what's going on here? Some people are being killed. It doesn't make any sense that these people are being killed. So, so what's going on here? And Jesus replies, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I, he says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jer Jerusalem? He says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. So they bring an example to Jesus of what the problem of evil. Some people are dying. It doesn't make sense. And Jesus is anticipating there, well, you, it's because you think there were sinners that they died, and that's why God killed them or allowed them to be killed by Pilate uh, than other people. He says, no, they weren't worse sinners. But then he says, but unless you repent, you'll die too. Then, he bring, then Jesus brings up his own example. Oh, what about the people who were crushed by the tower? He says, they weren't worse sinners. They were just sinners. Unless you repent, you'll die too. And when you put it together, by the way, it sounds a lot like 9-11 because you have terrorism and the collapse of a tower where they were sinners. One of the things that was terribly, you had some famous Christians get on TV and say, this is the reason these things happen because of certain sins. And Oh, anyway, uh, they weren't worse sinners in the two towers. They're just sinners. And people get killed by car accidents and people that get killed by earthquakes. And they're not worse sinners. They're just sinners. D.A. Carson makes some amazing points about this. He, he, he says, Jesus doesn't even hint that those who died didn't deserve it. Notice there's no hint. Rather, Jesus says, repent or you too will die. For Jesus, all death is one way or another the result of sin and therefore deserved. Jesus does insist that those who died weren't worse sinners. They were just sinners, and all sinners deserve to die. Whether you die from murder or accident isn't more than you deserve. Only God's mercy keeps you alive. Notice that Jesus doesn't use this, still Carson. Notice that Jesus doesn't use this as a segue into the mysterious ways of God. Rather, Jesus uses these disasters as a call to repent, to avoid God's judgment. Disaster is a call to repentance, and we only live because God is patient, not because we deserve it. That we question God's goodness or power or even existence in times of disaster is a sign of our sinfulness. Jesus didn't see it that way. That's spot on. I, I, I kind of get a kick out of this because I think, so the disciples go, we've just got the problem of evil here. We're going to ask Jesus about the problem of evil. Here we go. Okay, Jesus. Uh, some people are killed by, you know, the sword. It doesn't make any sense. Why do they die? Jesus says, this is a great problem of evil. Oh, they weren't worse sinners. They were just sinners. Unless you repent, you'll die too. Next. Whoa, Jesus. This is the great problem of evil. This is the question of the ages. This is the thing that philosophers consider to be the insolvable. Theologians tell us that we'll never be able to get to the bottom of it. The great problem of evil. People are dying, they're being willy-nilly, they're being killed by towers. What's going on here? And Jesus says, 
They weren't worse sinners. They were just sinners. If you don't repent, you'll die too. Next. Jesus, this is the problem of evil. They weren't worse sinners. They were just sinners. Unless you repent, you'll die too. Next. You get what I'm saying? All sinners deserve to die. I said at the beginning, this, the generation of Adam and Eve doesn't deserve to live in God's eyes. Doesn't deserve to live in God's eyes. I said that, talked about that last week. It doesn't deserve to live because we're all sinners and we're not good people. In fact, we commit genocide very, very quickly and adultery, I might add. Maybe you're only doing it in your heart slash mind, but we're really adulterous murderers at heart, except for the grace of God saying you can't be that kind of a person because you're changed inwardly. About human niceness. By the way, that picture there is Pol Pot. Uh, he's a guy you could like. Look at his face, smiling. Of course, he, en he engineered the murder of 1.7 million to 2 million people, somewhere in there. Uh, Ing Seri, his henchman, said to Pol Pot, his face was always smooth. Many people misunderstood that. He'd w smile, his unruffled smile, and they'd be taken away and executed. Uh, a guy, by the way, if you read about Pol Pot, uh, one guy said, you know, when I met him back in Paris, the killing fields were, really came out of the streets of Paris, but uh, back in Paris he knew Pol Pot, and he says, as soon as I met him, I knew this is a guy that I could be friends for life with. He's just such a nice guy. Well, probably not so much, eh? But people, you know, scripturally people go, so you're really saying that people could go and I'm talking now about those who have not been born again, uh, who have not been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And I would remind you, because I can, especially I can think of people online thinking, oh yeah, well look at all the bad things Christians do. That's why, by the way, as I told you, um, I'm doing, well, an entire three-hour session on crusades, inquisitions, witch hunts, Nazi Christians, uh, and uh, slavery, the oppression of women, and so on. And dealing with, yeah, but well, Christians aren't that good. We'll deal with that in, in detail for about three hours. But anyway, here's an interesting verse. So the Lord tells Israel, say, look, you cannot commit the sins of the Canaanites. If you do commit the sins of the, sins of the Canaanites, if you get ensnared by their sin, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let your cities become under, come under siege. Your cities are going to come under siege. And you're going to start starving to death because your city's under siege. And this is what's going to happen. Deuteronomy 28, 56. The most gentle and sensitive woman among you, so sensitive and gentle that she would not venture to touch the ground with the sole of her foot, will begrudge the husband she loves and her own son or daughter, the afterbirth from her womb and the children she bears, for she intends to eat them secretly during the siege and in the distress that your enemy will inflict upon you. Notice the Lord's saying, he says, if you start committing the sins of the Canaanites and I cause, allow your city, allow Israel's cities to come under siege, that not only will a gentle and sensitive woman, notice how he builds this up, so sensitive, I mean a nice, truly nice person, right? This is a nice person. She's so gentle and sensitive so that she wouldn't even let the sole of her foot touch the ground. I mean, she's just so t t gentle and sensitive. She says, she'll begrudge your ch child and her kids, or her husband and her kids, the afterbirth from her womb and the children, because she's going to eat them. So not only is she going to eat her children, she's even going to be selfish about it. All right? In other words, there but for the grace of God go I. There's something terribly wrong with humankind. So, you say, but, <clears throat> oh, what about Granny? Sure, Granny's not a Christian, but Granny works and, uh, you know, s helps out in the community center. Granny bakes cookies for the kids in our neighborhood, Toll House cookies. I mean, no, she's not a Christian, but isn't she a good person? No, she's not a good person. That doesn't make you a good person. Niceness isn't goodness. Do you not think 
that there aren't KKK moms that, are, that aren't baking Toll House cookies for the little white supremacist kids in their neighborhood? Sure there are. Do you, if you, when you read Holocaust studies, in a, as I have, it's really interesting because after this one German, after he, the, the Allies had bombed a crater in the runway, the Germans' runway in this one town, uh, and they filled it, they put 122 Jews in it, and they just then paved it over. But if you read his letter home, it's like, he writes to his wife, he says, how are the kids? Uh, how's the, how are the roses doing? I mean, you know, I mean, it's like, it, see, if you didn't know, if you knew him, you go, he's a nice guy. One of the interesting things, by the way, watch this, mark this. You'll see this again and again. You'll read about one serial murder after another, and they'll interview the neighbors, and the neighbors will go, he was a really nice guy. Helped out around the house, you know, helped in the neighborhood. There was this one guy in East L.A., as a matter of fact, I mean, they, they were saying about him, uh, you know, the, somebody's car broke down, he was there to fix it. You know, I mean, and, uh, you know, I mean, but he was killing people, of course, but everybody in the neighborhood thought he was a really nice guy. Well, not so much, it turns out. Turns out he was a serial killer. And we see this again and again. Most serial killers, they go, he seemed like a nice guy. Not all of them, but many of them. He was a nice guy. <clears throat> so we had a, when I first started teaching this years ago, a student came to me and says, kind of comes up, he goes, is this a message we want to get out? I mean, I mean, you really want to like talk about this, you know? And I said, well, I immediately replied, well, John 7, 7, Jesus said, the reason the world hates me is because I proclaim that what it does is evil, right? The reason the world hates me is because I proclaim that what it does is evil. So WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? Jesus went around proclaiming that the world's deeds were evil, especially to the good people of the world who were the Pharisees, don't you know? Who were the ones who had them kill, him killed, don't you know? And so, well, WWJD, be like Jesus and start proclaiming that the world's deeds are evil. If you do, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you will start living the exciting Christian life. You will. You go, you know, I'm not living the exciting Christian life. Start proclaiming that the world's deeds are evil and you will start living the exciting Christian life in all its fullness. In fact, when they start persecuting you, you can even be go, wow, Jesus said, you know, blessed are you when people speak evil against you. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. I mean, woohoo. Tell people the truth about their sinfulness, not to make them feel bad. That's not the point. Not to be, I'm better than you are because you weren't born better than anyone. But to get them to realize that they're sick sinners so that they can know the saving grace of Jesus. Right? And I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him were seraphs, each with six wings, and with two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the sound of their voices at the sound of their voices the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke and Isaiah says, woe to me, I cried, I'm a ruin, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live in a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. See, that's, God's holy. Let me kind of clear something up. I really respect Norman Geisler. I think he, this was an, an unfortunate uh, analogy that he came up with when it comes to God's fairness. <clears throat> you know, by the way, when you can find, well, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Norman Geisler wrote this. He says, suppose a farmer discovers three boys drowning in his pond where signs clearly forbid swimming. Further, noting their clear disobedience, he says to himself, they violated the warning and have brought these deserved consequences on themselves. Thus far, we may be willing to agree. But suppose by some inexplicable whim, he should declare, I have no obligation to save any of them, but out of the goodness of my heart, I will save one or two of them and let the other two or one of them and let the other two drown. In such a case, we would surely consider his love partial. And you know, by the way, that you've hit PowerPoint gold when you can find a Norman Rockwell of three boys running in front of a sign that says no swimming. 
I mean, and that's what the, the store, anyway, that's PowerPoint gold. Anyway, um, there's something desperately wrong with this, and I've actually been talking about what it is already. What's wrong with Norman Geisler's analogy here? There's something wrong with it. He, it's like the kids are really good, innocent kids. He's, he's depicting sin as being good, you know, well, we're just good, innocent kids. And I, I know Norman Geisler, Geisler wouldn't hold to that. I, I, I just think that he didn't, well, anyway. Let me change the story now based on what I've been telling you and give you a little bit of a different story. Uh, suppose a farmer went into town and while he was in town, a motorcycle gang raped and tortured to death his 12-year-old daughter and wife and he comes upon them, he's got a gun right because he's a farmer, it's in the back of the truck and he finds these guys who've just tortured to death his 12-year-old daughter and raped his wife and killed her too um, and he decided to let one of them go. What would we ask? Would we say, why didn't you let the others go too? No, that right, that wouldn't be the question, am I right? That wouldn't be the question, right? We'd say, why did you even let one of them go? See, this is what I'm talking about. Once you understand the depth of human depravity, it isn't like three kids who have disobeyed a no swimming sign. It's really, why are you letting adulterous murderers go? And this speaks to the greatness of God, doesn't it? We need then to be born again. Notice this is the, really the gospel here, by the way. I think, if anything, I'm presenting the gospel, if you will, maybe just in this aspect a little more fully. You need to be born again because of the seed of Adam, you're not a good person. Believe me, like I said, I was an adulterous murderer in junior high. 1 John 3 says, He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him, and he cannot go on sinning because he's been born of God. If you've been born again, you're no longer comfortable in sin. Christians at this point will say to me, they'll go, but I struggle with sin. And I go, that's right, exactly. You struggle with sin, you're not giving in to it. That's precisely what I'm talking about. See, before, when I was in, by, frankly, by the way, when I was in junior high, I really didn't struggle with sin. I struggled with getting caught. And to be very, you know, open with you, my clubhouse was, and I always had some sort of an underground, in a tree, something clubhouse, was always full of as much pornography as I could possibly get my hands on at 12. I didn't struggle with that. It didn't bother me. I struggled with getting caught. That bothered me. Now, as a Christian, I go, that's, no. You see? And, and Christians come to me and go, man, I'm struggling with sin. I go, good, brother. Woohoo! Keep the struggle going because that's right. Because that's a sign that the Holy Spirit's inside of you and you're not comfortable living in sin anymore. Yes, amen. Preach it. So, we now come to my 12 lessons. What did I get out of this? As I said, especially... When it came to reading Iris Chang or uh, 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 Daniel Goldhagen's, although the book is flawed, Hitler's Willing Executioners or uh, some of these, anyway, books on genocide and the Holocaust and whatnot, as I, as I told you, as I read these, all of a sudden I went, this is what humans do. Humans do this. This is what humans do. And that was life-changing, frankly. Uh, as I began to realize, humans murder and rape and torture and commit adultery really very easily. Really do. Their feet, Romans 3, their feet are swift to shed blood. Swift. Doesn't take much for them to kill. Actually kill in real. And I knew my life had changed. But it took me a while. You know, as time went on, I began to pull these together. So here, here's 12 reasons, 12 things, 12 benefits. The first one was Siri, it was very helpful, reveals, studying human evil revealed, reveals to us just how evil beings can be. This should be, by the way, you know, I did that PowerPoint dump to uh, Word, this, all of these will be in that dump that I did that I posted on Blackboard. 
it reveals how evil humans can be very really wicked right second it helps us realize that little sins aren't cute but vile first samuel 15:23 says for rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of adultery idolatry little sins aren't cute see i think we think there are a little bit of lust a little bit of gossip a little bit of lying it's not cute it's destructive, and if you let it go, it's just, it, it, well, it will, it will destroy. I think of the verse, Proverbs 18, 9 says, the man who's lazy is the brother of him who destroys. Uh, my home was built in the late 80s, and in the late 80s in Laguna Niguel, uh, homes, Laguna, they were putting up homes, I mean, as fast as they could, and frankly, some people didn't, some of the contractors didn't do a good job, especially when it came to water, well, leaking. And so many of the homes in this one track, they leaked when it rained. The wet rain had come in through the windows and so on. In fact, I just had my roof repaired in one place. And the guy that repaired my roof says, you know, they didn't actually put the tar, the tar didn't go over the top of the flashing, it went under the flashing. Well, for those of you that know what that means, it means the water just runs right under the flashing. Right? I, I mean, and the windows, they didn't, they didn't take care of the windows. They didn't, you know, and so people had to have big blowers in. Uh, the, the, the company that actually built our, our homes went out of business. I mean, it went bankrupt uh, because it couldn't pay for all the losses. And it says in Proverbs 18, verse 9, the man who is lazy is the brother of him who destroys. They cut corners. They might as well throw thrown rocks through our windows, frankly. It would have been less damaging because we would have gone, oh, okay, we better fix the windows. But... It would have been less damaging and, and less costly if they'd just thrown rocks through our windows. So notice, the man who's lazy is the brother of him who destroys. But the third benefit that I got out of this is uh, it really, understanding the depths of human evil really does demonstrate God's patience, doesn't it? God's patient, isn't he? God is patient. He puts up with us. It justifies God's judgment when we mere, as C.S. Lewis put it, when we merely say we are bad, the wrath of God seems a barbarous doctrine. As soon as we perceive our badness, it appears inevitable, a mere corollary from God's goodness. A guy, there was a, this is also in Copan's book, it's got a moral monster, he talks about, I've got to get this as a slide. There's this fellow who has lived in Bosnia, and the Christian, and he says, before the war that broke out in Bosnia, he says, he used to struggle with the wrath of God. He says, but then, when shells were coming in and blowing people apart in the middle of the city, and children and people are being killed, just being blown to bits all over the place, he had a very different opinion. He said, he said God wouldn't be just if he wasn't wrathful. And that's, that's true. That's spot on. Once you really, see, if you think, if you kind of go, oh, yeah, I know, people are sinners, la, 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 what am I having for dinner tonight? Um, if you treat it that way, God's wrath seems barbarous. It's like, man, he's, it's like he's mad all the time. Why is God mad all the time, right? He's always mad. I don't get what's going on with his madness. He's mad. But when you really understand how sinful humankind is, you go, no, his wrath is justified and is a mere corollary of his goodness. To be good, he can't let people get away with these things. Fifth, it magnifies the significance of Christ's sacrifice. Because Jesus didn't die for good folks, right? Jesus really did, the scripture says, die for sinners. And I mean really die hard, died in the wool, sinner sinners. Right? I mean, Jesus died for people who weren't good. His sacrifice would mean less if Jesus were really dying for good people. But he's dying for his enemies. It explains, six, it explains God's larger plan for our lives. Um, wow. As I began to realize this, I go, you know, uh, I, people need to be saved. I need to take this life very seriously. 
There is a beginning. We talked about Genesis, and we even backed up and talked about the fall of Satan. There's a middle, which we're in now, and there's an end. Jesus is coming back to judge the world with righteousness, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. The whole world will mourn because of him. Even so, come Lord Jesus. That's from Revelation 1, by the way. It impassions our witness in this sense. I, as a younger Christian, you know, you'd run into people go, oh, I'm a good person. And, we, I, and this is the kind of thing I'd say as a younger Christian. Oh, well, you know, God's holy and man is sinful. And because of his holiness, he can't put up with even one little itty bitty sin. I mean, even one little. So if you've committed like one itty little bitty sin, he can't put up with that because he's holy. And so you need to pray this prayer right now. And if you pray this prayer, you'll, he'll forgive you and you'll be saved and you'll go to heaven forever. Now, this person who never thought he wasn't a good person, who already, by the way, believed he was going to heaven, we get him to pray this prayer and we go, now you're saved, don't ever doubt it for a moment. He never, got, he never changed, he never got converted, he never thought he wasn't good. Well, it's hard to witness to people who already have a belief about themselves that they're basically good folks. It's hard to tell people, you're, God's going to send you to hell and inside go, but he's really a good person. You know, it's harder to, you know, but when you realize he's not really a good person. We're not born good people. We need to be born again. And passions are witness. Eight, it honors the memories of those who suffered. The memory of those who suffered. Ellie Wiesel said, wrote, to forget would not only be dangerous but offensive. To forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. I ask my classes this all the time. I've never had anybody respond differently. I want to give you the opportunity. If you were brutally murdered, would you want people to go, whoa, 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 I don't want to hear that, la, 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 I don't want to hear, you know, I mean, if it was you, right? If you were brutally murdered, would you want people, everybody to go, no, 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 don't tell me about it, I don't want to hear about it. Probably not, you know, probably not. Hey, no, don't go, la, 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 when it's my being brutally murdered. Uh, there's something to be said for recognizing the horror of what people have gone through and honoring them. Ah, this next one is huge to me. I'm not kidding you. As a, on a regular basis for me, this unsettles my, it unsettled my worldliness. And it continues to, uns ongoing, unsettles my worldliness. It unsettles it. I don't like this world, frankly. I don't. I'm not saying I'm a down person. And I think those of you that are getting to know me a little bit, and I think if you talk to the office staff, they certainly wouldn't say, oh yeah, Clay's kind of a downer, life sucks, but here I am, you know, I'm just going, you know, why shouldn't I be happy? Because it's my birthday, like Eeyore kind of a th thing. Um, so I'm not a downer person, but I tell you, I don't like this world. I don't. And that's a benefit. I Really, I'm, I'm t spiritually... I don't love this world. I don't love it. I can say that I love the people in the world, but I don't love the world. It's an icky place. So it's unsettles, it unsettles our worldliness. Related to that, and this is huge for me, frankly, it increases our desire for Jesus' return. I, I can't tell you. I, I will read about... See, now, frankly, when I'm reading the Los Angeles Times... And I read about somebody being raped or murdered. See, for me, to be very honest with you, it's an indictment of humankind. And I really find myself going, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I mean it. Jesus, come quickly. Because, see, when you don't, you don't want Jesus to come quickly when you're satisfied with the world. Do you understand? When you're happy in the world, you know, hey, things are going good. 401k is looking good. You know, I mean, my kids are going to be happy, wealthy, and wise. They're going to be successful, marry the right people. You know, I mean, I'm going to live, I'm living the American dream. It's all good. You're not in a hurry for Jesus to come back. But when you realize, well, as the non Christians, George Crenn and Leon Rapoport, where could, said, where can one find an affirmative meaning to life if humans can do such things? How do you have an affirmative meaning? I don't know as a non-Christian. I really don't. I don't think to look at this stuff hard on, I think you have to end up like Cran and Rappaport and go, I don't know how you can live life 
thinking about, I mean, we can't find an affirmative meaning to life. Look at what people do. Uh, Iris Chang, by the way, who wrote The Rape of Nan King, I don't know all of what was going on, but she started writing another book on the, oh, oh I wish I could do this, uh, on the railroad that was going on in Indochina or whatever, uh, which many, many people were just slaughtered in the way and were mercilessly killed. Uh, she killed herself. And I don't know what other issues she had going on in her life, but I, 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 don't, I don't know how, as a non-Christian, you can deal with this stuff I think what you have to do is turn on Friends and Seinfeld reruns and drink a lot and watch them endlessly. And see, because that's what most people do. And I run into Christians who are like, no, 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 I don't want to hear about these bad things. La, 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 la. I'm going to go home and, whoa, the office is on. I'm going to watch that, you know, reruns of the office for the rest of the night. Because that's how you deal with it, right? But there's a lot to be said for it unsettling our worldliness. It reveals also the greatness of our salvation, doesn't it? Because God didn't save me, the Clay Jones, the good person. He saved Clay Jones, the desperate sinner. I like D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, whom I've quoted to you before, says, We must contemplate men in sin until we are horrified, until we are alarmed, until we are desperate about them, until we pray for them, until having realized the marvel of our own deliverance from that terrible state, we are lost in a sense of wonder, love, and praise. Lloyd-Jones is spot on there, again, right on the money. We need to get desperate about humankind and realize the glory of our own deliverance from sin. And finally, number 12, to a large extent, understanding the depth of human evil answers the emotional problem of evil. What's one of the big, the big, how do you hear it? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, when you really come to grips with the depravity, the horror of humankind, with the fact that they, their mouths are full of cursing and that their feet are swift to shed blood, that they really are innately wicked, once you really come to grips with that, the problem of evil largely goes away because no one ever asks why bad things happen to bad people. Right? No one, hey, why a bad, you know, you'll never see it. I've never seen it in my life. Nobody ever says, God, why did that bad thing happen to that bad person? Nobody cares. They don't care. Hey, oh, yo. It's like, woohoo, he got his, right? I mean, that's really the response. He got his, woohoo. Nobody cares. So if we can really deal seriously with people really aren't good people. The, the, why do bad things happen? There are, happen to good people. Well, there are no good people. But let's not forget the gospel here. Jesus died on the cross for us so that we could be forgiven of our sins and we could be born again and we could be inwardly changed. That's the hope that we have. So, I'm done. Uh, let us, uh, I'll close in a word of prayer and then I'm going to take your questions. Father, bless these people. Give them a safe drive home. Reveal to them the glory that awaits them in heaven, which is we're going to spend three weeks talking about the glory that awaits them in heaven. Reveal that to them, Father. Keep them safe. Help them to just revel in heaven and, and all that you've done for them, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Any questions, comments, or complaints? Not, a, not, just, not a really a, a, an easy, happy-go-lucky session, eh? Yes, Chris. <clears throat> Good question. I'm, I'm not suggesting that the, that the image of God is totally obliterated. I'm just saying that, uh, sure, sure, we're still created in the image of God, but, but we are corrupted desperately. We still, the image of God isn't completely obliterated. I'm not suggesting that. No, absolutely not. So perhaps, so the, the badness <clears throat> or the, the lack of goodness, but maybe the nice, you know, why, 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 why the, um, the gangbanger can actually, uh, 
for the, 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 the serial killer that suggested would fix his neighbor's car. I mean, could, could that design Frankly, be part of the image today? I, I, for me, personally, I doubt it. I mean, I think it's just self-interest. I mean, hey, you know, you're a good guy. He's a good guy. Look at him. Yeah, you know, Bobby here. He'll fix your car. He's a, who doesn't like Bobby, you know? I mean, uh, I don't, for me, I don't think it's, I suspect that it's, there's nothing good. You know, I mean, as Jesus says, you know, even sinners do that. There's nothing, you know, do, lend to those who lend to you. Even sinners do that. There's nothing, no, no moral goodness in going with that. Anyone else? Yes, Carlos. Yeah. Speaking, but then to understand this concept and to try to fight the struggle, and the good thing that we're fighting, right, because it shows that the Holy Spirit's convicting us. But how does one then go to the point where one would, I know it's a process of sanctification, but how does one go to the point where one struggles less, not struggles less, but one does not want to follow a particular pattern um, so that one can truly say that we're pleasing God? Well, a uh, huge topic, but uh, in short, uh, we need to have our minds, the biggest, our, our problem, our bi humankind's biggest problem, the Christian's biggest problem, is that we're still thinking old thoughts. Uh, we still think that being good looking, or being strong, or being rich, or being whatever, even though we go, oh yeah, I'm saved, but we really think those things are valuable. Uh, we really think being, you know, like attractive to the opposite sex, really, that's, you know, that's cool. You know, I mean, that's got to have that, and so on. We really think those things are super, super valuable. And frankly, they're just not. But see, that's about renewing our mind. You know, Dallas Willard has put it, he says, don't ever tell people to live what they believe, because people always live what they believe. And when it comes to a lot of sin, we need to change the way we think about them uh, and, you know, I mean, frankly, when it comes to lust, whether they're after people, possessions, positions, or pleasures, um, we have to get rid of things that encourage those lusts and not... See, unfortunately, frankly, most of the Christians I know uh, are watching shows that are encouraging lust after people and possessions and, you know, I mean, they're, you know, I mean they're, they're watching television and shows and it's feeding it all the time. And you just have to get rid of everything that encourages those lusts and then make sure you're meditating on things that are going to do the opposite in you. Uh, and uh, one quick story, and then we'll, oh, we're late. Real quick, and we'll go. Um, <clears throat> this is really, Billy Graham told this story. Black, Eskimo is a black dog and a white dog, and he'd come into town every day, and the townspeople would come out, and they'd bet on which dog was, the dogs would fight, and they'd bet on which one's gonna fight, uh, win the fight. Every, every week he'd come into town, rather. And they'd bet on which one's gonna win the fight. And one week the black dog would win, and one week the white dog would win, and they never knew which was gonna win, the black dog or the white dog, and, but the Eskimo always won. So they said to him, uh, finally, very good friend, one day says, so how do you always know which dog's gonna win? And he says, simple, the dog I feed that week wins. And frankly, when it comes to the flesh, the dog that you feed is the dog that wins. And, and it's kind of an awkward, to put it that way, comparison. But if you feed the spirit and your mind is set on the kingdom of God and you're remo renewing your mind that way, you're going to find it easier to win over the flesh. If you're allowing, frankly, little bits of porn 
and you're going to be wanting a lot of bits of porn, frankly. If you're allowing little bits of you know, lust after the world, you're gonna want a lot of it, and, and so on. It's just, it's the way, so you have to get rid of the world, and you have to feed the spirit, and that means you have to be immersed in the word of God so that you're re seeing reality such that you just naturally responding to how, to the nature of reality, and that is there really is a God, and there really is eternity, and he really is coming back, and I'm going to live with him forever and ever and ever and ever, and he's giving me the kingdom to do what I want to do with it. And if that's your thought, then how much money you make or how strong you are is irrelevant. Frankly, it's just irrelevant. So, anyway, we're late. God bless you. See you next week. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.